indicators that do not require genetic data. Uh, we will be recording this presentation. It will be available on Geobond's YouTube channel later today, so we'll share that link with you. Also, we will share the slides of the presentation and important links that we share during this presentation with you afterwards. Um, just so you note, the organizers that have helped organize this meeting and will be giving a talk um, in the participants list, their name starts with double zero, so we can identify them easier if you're wondering where that is, or if you're looking for particular names, they should be at the top of the participants list. Um, please note that the participants can turn on the captions for a transcript and Zoom. If you would like quick clarifying questions, you can ask it in the chat, please do. We have people that can uh, translate English, French, Spanish, or Portuguese, so you're, feel free to ask those questions in those languages and our colleagues will try to answer them. Otherwise, please hold your questions till the question answer session. And we're going to start today. So our first speaker, we have Jillian Campbell from the CBD Secretariat, who's gonna give us a few words. Jillian, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to this webinar today, um, Giovan. So for those of you who are not aware, which probably everyone is, we are moving in, in less than a month. We will be meeting in Montreal to agree on the next global biodiversity framework. Um, this represents a, a huge effort that's happened over the last few years to get agreement on what the global priorities should be in terms of biodiversity. And if you compare the current Global Biodiversity Framework draft with Pachi, which was of course the, the one 10 years ago. Um, there are some major changes. One is that what's going to be agreed in Montreal next month has a vision up to 2050. So it has this longer term look of where we actually want to be in terms of protecting our biodiversity for the next 30 years. The other big achievement, which I think is relevant for the work of Geobond, is that there is a commitment from parties to agree on a set of indicators that will be used for um, the goals and targets of the global biodiversity framework. And if previously, the, the indicators were not agreed by the parties. It was developed after the adoption of the targets. And, um, and this was something that was, was recognized by COP14 as a weakness, is the lack of of a very strong monitoring framework that parties also subscribe to. And so the current draft of the monitoring framework that's going forward for COP to discuss includes three sets of indicators. It includes headline indicators, which would be a part of the core reporting template for national reports of every single country. Um, and I should mention here that national reporting is a, is a legal obligation. Under the convention. So all parties are required to report. It. So this would really escalate the use of, of data by countries um, in a consistent way to have these headline indicators agreed. Uh, additionally, there's uh, two other sets of indicators, component indicators, which attempt to still be relevant for parties and, and fill gaps in, in understanding the goals and the targets, because obviously a single indicator can never be used to comprehensively understand uh, you know, any of the targets. And so these component indicators would aim to fill some of the key gaps in the scope of each goal or target. And then we have complementary indicators, which are a longer list that, that tells you uh, additional information that may be useful for analysis. So this is the structure of the monitoring framework that is going forward. Um, I just wanted to mention again that what we have seen from the Secretariat side is that parties across the board, you know, whether they do recognize how important monitoring is, there has been great consensus on the need to have monitoring that's nationally relevant, um, to have monitoring that's included in the national reports, uh, that's included in national planning processes, uh, to focus on um, or to to also focus on things that are 
feasible, but recognizing that additional capacity building will be needed on monetary. And so this is a moment in time where I think even if there's some areas of the framework where there's not consensus, this idea that we're going to monitor better really does have consensus. Um, and so as we're moving forward to the COP, now the questions I think are, how do we, how do we really measure what is going to need to happen in the next 10 years so that countries in there are in the best position to be able to monitor these important issues? And, and also, um, how do we make sure that there's balance between the different topics in the, in the goals and the targets so that we are monitoring the actions that it would take to get us where we want to be. We're monitoring progress towards actually achieving these biodiversity outcomes. And we're also monitoring the, the means of implementation underneath it and what financing looks like. So that's what this package looks like. So in a second, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Natasha, who is with UNEP WCMC. They've been our, our key technical partner that's been doing a lot of the uh, background analysis of the monitoring framework. And so she's going to give you a, a bit of an introduction on what this framework looks like at the moment. And then I'll be handing over to um, Sean and, and Linda. And so there have been, in terms of the genetic diversity indicators, a, a wide variety of scientists and stakeholders that we've been working with the CBD Secretariat and that have been providing different sorts of information papers and guidance to, to parties. And in particular, Dr. Cristiano Bernessi of the Foundation Edmund Mach um, in Italy has been representing the European Cost Action, um, which is the Geobike. And then there's Dr. Linda Lakery of the Stockholm University. She's from Sweden and, and she's been representing IUCN SSC Conservation Genetics, the specialist group, and Dr. Sean Hopin of the Morton Arbitorium uh, in Chicago. And he's been representing the, the Geobond Genetic Composition Working Group. And they've worked hard to clarify these genetic diversity concepts um, to reach consensus in the scientific community and to provide guidance on which genetic diversity indicators should be in the framework. Um, and so after we hear from Natasha, then we'll hand over to uh, Linda and Sean to, to give a, a presentation on what those genetic diversity indicators look like. So Natasha. Hi there, I'm just checking that you can see my screen and that it is a presentation. Could somebody just... Yes, we can see it. Okay. Uh, but I think it's on presenters mode, so you have to click on display settings and switch to yes. Okay, do you have it now? No, it disappeared. Mm. So oh, sorry about this. Do you have it now? Yes. Great. Yes. Perfect. All yes. right. That hasn't eaten too much into my time. Um, so as Julian's just described, the monitoring framework, um, the monitoring framework was um, something that was first considered um, at COP14 and there was a mandate established for SUBSTA, the subsidiary body on scientific and technical and technological advice, to go away and think about the elements that should be included to monitor implementation of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And this monitoring framework has had various iterations throughout the process of development and was finally discussed at COP15 next month. And Gillian's already given an overview of how it looks. So the proposal on the table for discussion is a suite of different types of, head, of indicators. There are headline indicators, which Gillian adequately described as um, a set of uh, headline um, high level indicators, which would cover the overall progress towards the adopted goals and targets. And these should be used at the national scale, used for national reporting, but could also be used um, at the global scale for communication purposes. And these can be complemented by component and complementary indicators, which would give a little bit more detail on implementation. And of course, these can very well be complemented for the further level um, at national, but with national indicators. 
And there is a proposal for a set of criteria for each of the indicators that are included in the monitoring framework. I don't have time to go through all of these in detail. Essentially, it's uh, the criteria covering whether or not an indicator is available for use, whether or not it's been peer reviewed and through, been through some sort of um, scientific process uh, to develop the methodology that it is updated, essentially, and that there is a mechanism or at least an institution who is um, supporting the development of the indicator throughout the time frame of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So just to give you a bit of background on what, what, how we've got to the point we have now with the monitoring framework, at Substa 24 in Geneva earlier this year, the parties recommended a further analysis of the proposed monitoring framework and the indicators. And parties put forward some ideas for additional indicators that could be included in a monitoring framework. And they asked, parties asked that the executive secretary compile the comments uh, so far on, on the, um, on the monitoring framework and to facilitate a scientific and technical review, including holding an, a workshop, an expert workshop, which was convened in June to July in Germany this year. And you can find the documents from that, uh, from that workshop uh, following this link. So that workshop included 25 experts, five from each of the regions, um, uh, parties of the CBD, and a selection of um, experts from observer organizations, including many who are included as, as presenters in this meeting. We, um, the, the experts at that meeting discussed that broadly um, how the indicators meet the criteria for consideration that I showed in a previous slide, and whether or not they're suitable to measure the key elements of the draft framework. And they also considered what is needed to make sure that headline indicator is going to be fully operational at the adoption of the post-2020 framework within a particular time frame, and uh, whether or not capacity building would be required with countries in order to use that headline indicator. The experts came up with a, a list of, of further criteria in terms of whether or not an indicator should be included. So they ranked the headline indicators one to five one being in a headline indicator which meets all of the criteria and is available for use now and therefore should be adopted, and two, similar, but also some further development may be, ne may be necessary, and three, indicators which are very much required but need further development and therefore represent a gap in the suite of indicators. So, the document that you see uh, in decision, uh, sorry, in document CBD COP 15 slash two on item 9B contains a list of 36 proposed headline indicators, which is based on recommendations from Substa and the inputs from the experts in Bonn. This is, um, this is the, that, that relates to the headline indicators. And then in addition to that, the Secretariat and UNEP WCMC uh, further rationalise the list of component and complementary indicators, again looking at their suitability towards the draft goals and targets of the post-2020 framework, and then that, that is also included. So just to, so that you're aware, one of, of those um, headline indicators, nine of them are scored as one, i.e. ready for use, 14 are scored as two, i.e. requiring further development, and my slides come up, and 13 are scored as three, i.e. representing a gap and requiring um, a, a development to have a, an indicator in that space. Experts in Bonn also identified an additional indicator type. There are those that could be compiled through national reporting because they represent a sort of a response to a yes, no, i.e. has, for example, has, has, um, has a country updated its, its national uh, biodiversity strategy and action plan. And these are indicators that, that would be collated through national reporting and therefore could be combined to, to create a global scale indicator. So just so you're aware as well, the monitoring framework, in addition to these headline indicators, composes 52 component indicators and 257 complementary indicators, which can be used by parties as appropriate. So just to give you an example of what it looks like, for goal A, for example, there are five um, headline indicators proposed, and you can see the ranking that was applied by uh, the BOM experts. And in particular, I just wanted to, to highlight the bottom uh, indicator here, which is probably relevant to this discussion today. And then some other issues that I think it's important to note in relation to the monitoring framework. So um, 
there is, as you could, as you will see when you're reviewing the document, there is no single headline indicator that fully captures the, the overall scope of every single component of the proposed goals and targets. So therefore, as Gillian noted, headline indicators, we expect that they would be supplemented by the other types of indicators um, as required by parties. There are some indicators which are cross-cutting. When you read the Bonn expert report, you'll see that we've highlighted when an indicator can be used for multiple goals and targets. And the way that that's used needs to be further considered. Um, there are some target, as I've already mentioned, there are some indicators that might be compiled through national reports, which I've already highlighted. Um, and the experts of Bonn also noted that there are some indicators for which um, capacity building will be required at the national level. And some of these will require a level of resources attached to them. So we've noted this in the Bonn, um, the Bonn report. And also there will be a need for further development of some of the methodologies that are proposed for the headline indicators. And that will require some additional resources. Um, Natasha, sorry to interrupt you. Can you please approach to, to the end of the, okay, that's perfect. <laughs> perfect timing, perfect timing. Thank you very much. Thanks, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Natasha. That's a, a very comprehensive summary. I think it, it's important to, to talk about the types of indicators and how it's it's developed and um, the importance of the monitoring framework now going towards COP. So our first speaker is going to be Linda Laker, and she's our first expert. And she's going to be talking to us about what is genetic diversity and why it's important. So please, Linda, go ahead. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining our webinar. Very glad to see you all here. So when we talk about biodiversity, we typically think about species and ecosystems. And we know that when we lose specific species, these can have devastating effect for entire ecosystems. But in addition to these level of biodiversity, we also have the genetic diversity and that's variation within species. So it originates at the DNA level where a specific gene can occur in different variants. We call them alleles and I symbolize them with colors here. And this variation builds up into genetic diversity within populations and genetic diversity between populations. And between population genetic diversity also reflects genetic adaptations to local environmental conditions. And this diversity is the toolbox for evolution. It's needed for adaptation, for long-term survival, and is the basis for all biodiversity. And when we lose a genetically distinct population, this can have equally poor effect for the ecosystem as a whole. So genetic diversity within species is equally important as species diversity. And what we focus on here is naturally occurring genetic diversity within and between populations of species that's necessary for population speakers and ecosystem to survive in the long term. So we are not dealing with GMOs, genetically modified organisms or any other kind of genetic manipulations, but rather natural genetic diversity. And we know from decades of research that high genetic diversity is associated to high adaptive capacity, good potential for long-term survival and a high resilience for the population that contains this variation. Whereas depleted populations, very little variation is associated to low adaptive capacity, weak potential for survival and low resilience. And there are many empirical examples of this. One important example that was recently published is corals where genetic specific genetic compositions are better at adapting to warmer ocean temperatures than others so genetic diversity within these species is essential for being able to adapt whereas an example of poor of low genetic diversity an isolated population of wolves at isle royale in north america over decades lost their variation, became extremely inbred with many disorders that resulted in the population collapse. And there are many similar examples. Here's another important one from Australia, where we have kelp forests. And again, marine heat waves caused devastating effects to areas with low genetic diversity. Moderate genetic diversity areas were affected, but only partially, whereas high genetic diversity areas, kelp forests there were only minor or not affected at all. And there are many more examples that you can find on this website here. And 
the process is then for when we lose genetic diversity, that's when we lose genetically distinct populations. So that's a reduction process. And also within population, if we have populations going too small, they will lose their genetic diversity. Other processes can be human induced selection. So when we harvest from natural populations, we remove individuals, we kill them for food, for instance. And if, if the individuals that we kill carry specific genetic compositions, this, this harvest will result in a depleted gene pool. And that's human induced selection. And a fourth process could be if we have a natural population here and we start to release something that's not natural from a hatchery, for instance, if it's fish, this can have devastating effects also for the natural population. So these are processes that we need to keep track of and we need indicators to be able to detect these kind of losses. And we propose an indicator for within population genetic diversity, which we call our indicator one. And we have an indicator for the between component, which is our indicator two, maintaining populations. And then uh, we have proposed a third indicator that use DNA data for, for detecting these kind of processes. And Sean Hoban will talk more about this, but just focusing on the, this indicator, the within population indicator. And we can envision an, a symbol like this, an olive, where the green area would represent the number of mature individuals within this population, the sensor size, while the red area symbolizes the effective population size. And that's how the population acts genetically. It's the, this area here of the, of the symbol that determines the rate of loss of genetic diversity. So the effective population size determines the rate at which genetic diversity is lost. And usually, as indicated here, this NE is much, much smaller than what the sensor size indicate. But this NE is, of course, a key component to biodiversity conservation. And because what we are interested in for our population is how fast it loses genetic diversity, if it's large enough to maintain sufficient levels, and the NE is the, is the parameter that will provide the answer to this. It can be estimated from molecular data, but that can be complex. So we propose a simplified indicator to use because it's well established in the scientific community that when we reach NE above 500 for a population, that means that population retains sufficient levels of genetic variation to be able to adapt. So this is why we have formulated a suggestion for indicator, namely the number of populations within species with an effective population size NE above 500 compared to the number below. And that's now proposed as headline indicator A5 for the COP document discussing the indicators. And if we don't, we can use sensor size as a proxy for NE. We can estimate any for molecular data, but if that's not possible, we can use this general relationship between NE to NC, which is typically 0.1. That's been shown in several scientific reviews. There's variation between taxa but this is a mean or median value that's often that's uh, being reported. So typically NE is 10% out of NC, meaning that if we are to reach NE 500, we will need a sensor size of 5,000. So that, that's what we propose to use as a proxy. And thank you very much for your attention. And by that, I leave the floor to Sean Hoban for speaking more about our proposed indicators. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. My name is Sean Hoban. I'll be presenting on behalf of a diverse group of scientists from the, around the world, working with different organizations who have developed genetic diversity indicators for use in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. As you know, genetic diversity is a key component of both goal A and target four of draft one of the GBF. As Linda has just shown to you, genetic diversity within and among populations of species helps species adapt to environmental and climate change and diseases and pests. It makes ecosystems more resilient to extreme weather and other disturbances, and it supports 
ecosystem services, nature's contributions to people, and the success of habitat restoration. So how can we maintain genetic diversity and ensure that species can adapt? There are three things we can do. We can make sure that populations are sufficiently large. This is the NE500 that Linda just spoke about to maintain adaptive variation. We can prevent the loss of distinct populations like distinct traits or variants that can be adapted to different environments. And when possible, we can monitor DNA of high priority species and use the knowledge from those studies for management. This led us to propose three and develop three indicators, the proportion of populations within species with an effective size above 500, the proportion of distinct populations maintained or not lost, and the number of species and populations where genetic diversity is monitored with DNA. There are other important complementary indicators, including the genetic scorecard developed by Scotland, which are very useful, but which we will not talk about today. Parties have had a chance to give their opinions about these indicators over the past two years. In 2021, there were at least 21 comments supporting one or more of these indicators in a survey. And from the meetings this year, there was general support for the concepts of these indicators, but parties had questions about feasibility, data availability, and relevance, and we will talk about that today. I will talk about these, and then we will see examples from four different countries of uh, agencies actually employing these indicators. So just to explain each indicator in more detail, proportion of populations with an effective size above 500. As you can see in this diagram, when NE is above 500, the loss of genetic diversity is almost zero. But once populations get below NE500, the loss of genetic diversity over time is very rapid and extreme. So this is a sufficiently large size to prevent genetic erosion, inbreeding, and maintain adaptive capacity. This indicator should be understandable to many CBD stakeholders because the NE concept has been used to determine if agricultural breeds are threatened for over 30 years. So uh, the CBD indicator on threatened breeds already uses this concept and breeds are analogous, very similar to populations of wild species. This is measurable. There is data available, as you will see from examples from countries in the next presentations. We simply need uh, the census size of each population. This can be obtained from a variety of sources, species management reports, red list assessments, citizen science counts, and from the area of suitable habitat. And you will see examples of this throughout today. Second indicator, the proportion of distinct populations maintained. This is relevant so that we can maintain genetic adaptations to cold or heat or different nutrient availability or predators or pests or things like that. This should be understandable because people can even see different populations are adapted to different habitats and different resources. And maintaining them gives the whole species options for survival in the future. This should be measurable using some of the same data sources where we just have um, records of current populations and historic populations. Lastly, about using DNA data, when feasible, not feasible right now for all countries and certainly not for all species, but for priority species, using DNA-based analysis can inform management action. It can inform when we want to do translocations or planting and restoration. This is fairly easy to report on because it's simply a number of species um, in which such studies are available for a country. So importantly, these indicators, and we will focus mostly on the first two, NE500 and populations maintained, these indicators are for reporting on about 100 or more species per country, not all species in a country. So to be feasible, but representative, 100 species would be the amount. Here's one example of where the data comes from. This is a report on an endemic species in the United States, a map of current populations and the current population counts. It was fairly easy to extract this information and compare it to our NE threshold, and then to read the report and see if populations have been lost. So we could quantify information on current and historic populations. This information has been compiled by local experts in the country, 
And so we are leveraging in-country data and expertise and existing uh, monitoring programs and infrastructure in the country. These are the indicator values for this species. How many species are data available? The Swedish Environmental Protection Agency sought to answer this question. They assessed whether data could be available for over 22,000 species in Sweden. They found that about 30% of species had some census data available and 20% of species had range data available. So again, the indicators cannot be done for all species in a country, but in this country, they could be done for at least thousands of species. And so we think that threshold of 100 is certainly feasible. Then the Swedish EPA calculated the indicators for a smaller number of species. They found that, and I will just show mammal data for time's sake, 51% of mammal populations are below the NE 500. 16% of mammal species are losing their populations, and then 3% of species have genetic studies. So these are the three indicators. Doing the evaluation of data availability for 22,000 species and then calculating these indicators took one person about six months of effort. So this is very feasible and we are working on our infrastructure and protocols to make it even easier and faster. So you can see that genetic indicators highlight a very important conservation concern, genetic losses, genetic erosion that would not otherwise have been known by this country. As you will see, we will have four presentations after this um, uh, of nine countries who are currently testing the indicators for 100 species per country. We are working directly with personnel from these biodiversity agencies so that it will actually be put into use. You have expressed concerns over time, and I will briefly address those. We can do more in the question and answer session. Is DNA data needed? No, not for... Um, the any and population maintained indicator, only census and population data are needed. Is there enough data? Yes, there should be enough data for more than 100 species per country. The time needed is about one month for a team of three people. They are flexible, adaptable, using a variety of data sources or infrastructure within each country, so it can be very much adapted. And we can leverage existing national biodiversity resources, databases, programs to save time and money. We think these are useful even beyond CBD reporting, that they can in actually inform species management as well. So it's not just for reporting purposes. And we think there's um, a good alignment with the red list process such that assessing the indicators could happen during red list updates. Here's our timeline. Next year, we will be scaling up these indicators to test them in more countries, doing training in multiple languages. And we welcome your participation in making suggestions and improving them. Lastly, I want to mention that the indicators are connected to goal A and target four, wording from the most recent informal group. Indicator one is connected to genetic diversity and adaptive potential within populations of species is maintained. Again, this gives each population the capacity to adapt to rapid change. The proportion of populations maintained is connected to genetic diversity and adaptive potential of all genetically distinct populations are maintained. Again, this helps give the whole species options for surviving in the future. The option two wording from the informal group is less specific, uh, not as clearly connected, but the indicators could still be used. The DNA-based method is a complementary indicator and is not currently reflected in goal A. Lastly, target four, maintain and restore genetic diversity within and between populations of all species to maintain their adaptive potential. All three indicators could be used for reporting on this. So maintaining genetic diversity within and between populations of all species is critical for both goal A and target four, and the wording is connected to the indicators. I conclude that the indicators are sensitive to genetic change, they're feasible, scalable, there's data available, and an increasing number of parties are interested in trying them out. Thank you very much. And now we will hear from the four countries four of the nine countries testing out these indicators, starting with Ivan Pazvinas of France. Thank you, Sean. Hello, so I'm Ivan Pazvinas. 
and with my colleagues, uh, Miriam Oertz, Iris Long, and Gael O'Brien, we are currently testing the proposed genetic indicators for France. So France and territories that fall within French regulations like overseas territories host an exceptional biodiversity. For instance, 98% of French Guiana is covered by forest and some other territories are located within uh, biodiversity hotspots. So it is estimated that almost 10% of all known species are present in territories on, under French law regulations. So preserving and monitoring all facets of biodiversity, including genetics within these territories is crucial, not only for France, but also for the world. So with colleagues from many other countries, we are uh, making a pilot study to calculate the proposed genetic indicators for 100 species per country. And this figure summarizes the rationale of the study. So we have here the three indicators and to estimate these indicators, we can use genetic information, but this is not needed or mandatory because we can also calculate these indicators using demographic and geographic information. So each country has to make a list of uh, species and then to identify uh, available data and uh, uh, experts. And then uh, each country can uh, select uh, different strategies to cater the data to calculate these in indicators. It can be a manual uh, extraction procedure, or it can be, for instance, a consultation with experts or a, an, an automated data extraction from uh, monitoring databases. So for the French trial, we use a manual approach given the good quality of available data. So we selected 100 species from a wide range of taxonomic groups, including insects, fish, mammals, also birds, amphibians. We tried to cover all major realms uh, from terrestrial to marine, all national red list, red list statuses, and also different life history traits, for instance, different longevities. So uh, we selected these species based on data availability on open access databases like the ENPN uh, uh, website, also on reports from the French UCN red list assessments, but also based on our own uh, expertise and knowledge of species at the country level. The different web portals and technical reports uh, are very useful to delimit uh, populations and to find uh, information on population sizes. We also use other databases like Telebotanica or FishBase to, uh, to get K, uh, information on species like life history traits. And uh, we also look for scientific publications that directly reported population sizes. So here is an example of how we proceed. So this is for the plant species Angelica terocarpa, which is an endemic species in France Atlantic uh, river basins and in estuaries. So uh, for this species, we delimited four populations using distribution maps. And there is a genetic study that confirmed the geographical population structure. Uh, thus, uh, the genetic study uh, was used for uh, calculating indicator three. So indicator three equal one for this species. Uh, for the four species, we get uh, census sizes and uh, two over four populations had uh, census sizes above uh, 5,000, so uh, the indicator was 0 0.5, indicator one, and uh, all the populations have been maintained in time. We didn't identify uh, extinct populations, so uh, indicator two was equal to one for this species. So the second example is for a bird, Tetra uruguayus, which is a species that is widely distributed across Eurasia but uh, for which there are only three extant populations in France at the moment. So there was no genetic study for this species, indicator three is equal to zero. Uh, we found information on census size for the three current populations, indicated that only the population in the Pyrenees might have a census size greater than 5,000. So here the indicator one is equal to 0 0.33. And we found information about two extant populations, uh, so indicator two was equal to 0 0.6 for this species. So once we can have calculated all the indicators for multiple species, we can estimate uh, an indicator at the country level. And for this example, with using four species, we have 0 0.25 for the indicator one, 
0.9 for the maintained populations indicator and 0.75 for the DNA studies indicator. So we expect having evaluated 75 species by the end of December using this manual approach and all the species by January. And then for the next year, we would like to implement automated data extraction uh, procedures that will use data from national demographic uh, monitoring databases. And to conclude, uh, deploying the proposed genetic indicators for France is feasible, even in the absence of genetic data. And these indicators are useful and usable to monitor genetic diversity at the country level. Thank you for your attention. And now I leave the floor to Jessica da Silva from South Africa. Thank you, Vivan. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Jessica da Silva, and I will be giving you a South African perspective on these indicators. Um, South Africa has a strong focus on biodiversity mapping, monitoring, and reporting. And previously, this was mainly focused on ecosystems and species levels. However, the country does recognize that genetic diversity carries essential information that can better inform species management. And in 2018, um, genetic diversity got its first platform on the National Biodiversity Assessment. And we would like to carry this forward in the um, years to come. To choose our 100 species, I first approached a variety of taxon experts. Unfortunately, not all of them could participate at the time due to various commitments, but we did have rep we do have representatives from amphibian, reptile, mammal, marine species groups. And each were asked to select approximately 20 species within their groups and uh, to try to diversify across a range of categories, um, such as habitats, whether they're endemics, their distributions and conservation status, just to name a few. Um, and we also wanted to showcase um, the species that where the data was thought to be, where the indicator data was thought to exist. We then filled in some gaps with some underrepresented groups, such as plants, birds, and freshwater fish. Uh, the data sources we used were quite varied. We also used a manual approach, and we scoured through the scientific literature, biodiversity management plans, which are gazetted in legislation, South Africa has a strong history of national and global red listing. So there's a fountain of information in there. We also use national and international currents databases such as iNaturalist and GBIF. And we then tapped into local knowledge holders and experts for even more updated information that might not be reflected in these other data sources. As a first example, I'll take you to an amphibian. It's critically endangered, it's narrow endemic. Um, currently, uh, extensive surveys found that only two populations exist and that four have gone extinct. Um, and so based on that information already, we can calculate indicator two. Um, so two out of six, and that's 0 0.33. And of the two remaining populations, one has just above 2,000, the other is just below 2,000. And so um, neither meet the threshold using a 0 0.1 ratio. Um, so for indicator one, the value is zero. But there has been temporal genetic monitoring studies on the species. And so for indicator three, we have a value of one. Our next uh, species is another critically endangered uh, narrow endemic, and it's the Albany cycad. Um, there is no records of extinct populations within this group, and a genetic study did find that all remaining individuals are part of a single um, genetic group population. Um, the census size conducted in 2020 revealed that there is only 70 plants remaining in the wild. And so this far exceed, um, so is an underestimate. So yeah, it does not meet the criteria of 500. So it's for 5,000. So it gets a value of zero. Indicator two gets a value of one because the population is still there. And indicator three gets a value of one because data does exist, gen genetic data does exist. For the African buffalo, 25% of the global range exists in South Africa, and this is least concerned nationally. Um, extinctions are unknown, um, and there's, it's possible that more populations exist. And so based on this, we weren't able to calculate indicator two. But of the three populations that are known, uh, extensive census data is available, um, as is a ratio and a 
effect of population size to census size ratio. And so we applied that to the census sizes and we were able to calculate NE for the three populations. And two of them met the criteria, the threshold of 500. And so we have a value of 0 0.67 for indicator one. Um, and indicator three, there's extensive genetic studies on this species. And so we were able to explore that one. The next one is a southern white rhinoceros. This isn't a species, it's actually a subspecies, but it's nationally of national importance. 86% um, of the distribution of the subspecies is found in South Africa. Um, it's also considered a single genetic cluster, so all the individuals are part of a population, and a recent census size in 2021 found that there's just under 13,000 individuals in South Africa. However, genetic study found that the effect of population size is 21, which is far lower than what the 0.1 ratio would suggest. And this is likely stemming from how highly inbred the individuals are, probably from the um, a significant bottleneck that happened late in the 19th century. So for the indicators, uh, indicator one has a value of zero, indicator two has a value of one since the population is still there, and indicator three, again, extensive um, genetic studies have been done, so that gives a value of one. My last species to show is the blue swallow, another critically endangered species in South Africa. However, globally, it's considered vulnerable. Um, South Africa is thought to have just one of the clusters, um, and so uh, it's thought to be just one population. The census size in South Africa is just 29 breeding pairs, and so that leaves us with 58 mature individuals. There have been many local extinctions uh, within the, the populations, but it's still considered um, to be one, one unit, one population. And unfortunately, there have not been any genetic studies conducted. So the scores for indicator one are zero, indicator two, one, and indicator three, zero. So when we put them all together, what we see is that for our national indicator for value for indicator one is 0 0.13, for indicator two, 0 0.83, and um, for indicator three, 0 0.8. But we can also rearrange things. And so because we have two mammals, we can look at the means for indicator one, and that would change it to 0 0.34 just for these two mammals. And then one, a value for one for indicator two. And then we can also look at just the critically endangered species and our indicator values change drastically. And now indicator one is just a value of zero. So what we hope is that by early next year, we'll have all of our 100 plus species analyzed. And, but we want the most of this to be done um, by the end of November. And we have been seeing that the research component takes anywhere from 30 minutes to about four hours for a given species and to enter the data onto our data collection form, the COBO form, which you'll hear more about, is um, about 10 to 30 minutes. Um, and so it, it's, it's a sufficient time. We should be able to complete everything in good time. And our projections for the next two years are to align our assessments with IUCN Red List reassessments. Um, and already we have amphibians and mammals um, lined up. And that's really great. And we'll have to see how these indicators form for complete taxonomic representation. And my little bits of advice are to involve a variety of stakeholders, involve academia, local and provincial governments, NGOs. All these um, industries and organizations have fountains of information. Um, and so just use them, experts, students, everyone that's there, traditional knowledge holders, and to align efforts with existing initiatives to maximize on resources and outputs. Um, and also just to try it out because we are seeing more and more that it really is possible to conduct this work. Thanks so much. And I'll take it to our next colleagues. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, but not presentation mode. Now. That's, yeah, good. Now. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> hello, my name is Victoria Köppe, and I'm part of the Swedish team together with Linda Leikre, Per Kögren Gulve, and Henrik Turfjell. Sweden is dedicated to monitoring genetic diversity and work has begun on indicator three in 2020 for important fishes and habitat forming species. 
Indicator one and indicator two are currently being tested with the use of non-genetic data. As Sean mentioned earlier, an initial trial with uh, national red list data showed that 33% of species have data for indicator one and 20% have data for indicator two. Now we are performing a more detailed assessment of 100 species and providing guidelines for how national red list ass assessments can be improved to include data for indicator one and two. Amphibians and reptiles will be prioritized because they're very important for national conservation. We are using a number of already existing and readily available resources, such as red list data, national action plans, and biogeographic surveys, as well as citizen science data in combination with uh, research papers and rep reports and consulting experts. For example, the SLU Species Information Center um, provides a searchable database with information on species and red list assessments and distribution data through the species observation system. The species observation system contains both data reported by authorities such as county boards and citizen science data. And the system provides maps with observations that allow for estimating distribution and, in some cases, the number of populations. And I will now go through two examples of species assessments performed using these sources. Uh, <clears throat> the pool frog uh, is mainly found in three metapopulations uh, in the county of Uppland. Um, it has also been discovered in a small area in the county of Östergötland and uh, here, and most recently in Blekinge. And none of these populations have a census size larger than 5,000. And this means that using an NE to NC ratio of 0 0.1, um, it means that the estimated NE is smaller than 500 for all five populations, which gives a total value of zero for indicator one. Um, there's no information on extinct populations in Sweden, and therefore the value for indicator two populations maintained uh, is one. And there is some uh, genetic information on pool frogs in Sweden, but there's no temporal DNA studies, and therefore the value for indicator three is zero. And also here, the agile frog, um, it's found in the county of Skåne, uh, Blekinge, uh, and Småland and Öland, the island of Öland in southern Sweden. And Erland houses, houses the largest metapopulation, which is clearly larger than 5,000 individuals. The remaining populations are smaller and isolated and likely below 5,000 individuals. Again, based on an E to NC ratio of 0 0.1, uh, only one out of eight populations have an estimated an E larger than 500. And this gives a value of 0 0.125 for indicator one. All the populations are still being maintained and this gives a value of one for indicator two. And there's no genetic monitoring for agile frog in Sweden and therefore the value for indicator three is zero. The assessments for individual species are tallied and a national average uh, for each indicator can be calculated. And this table shows the summary of assessments for five species that together yields a value of 0 0.23 for indicator one, 0 0.71 for indicator two, and 0 0.4 for indicator three. This means that 23% of populations have an effective population size larger than 500, 71% of the populations are maintained, and that there is genetic monitoring for 40% of the species. The goal is to provide assessments for 100 species in this fashion. As mentioned, amphibians and reptiles are prioritized. Uh, in addition to them, the aim is to cover examples of different taxonomic groups, habitats, and threat level. 
Thank you for listening. With that, I hand over to our next presenter, Alicia Mastreda Yanez from Mexico. Hello. Um, can you confirm if you are seeing my presentation, please? Yes. Yeah. Very good. good. So I'm going to talk on behalf of Conavio. Um, that's include my colleagues from different departments within Conavio, but also students and researchers from other institutions that are helping in this exercise. Mexico is a very complex country because we are very large. We are also mega diverse with very different uh, type of ecosystems. We're also a center of origin and domestication of several important crops, which implies that we have native land races as well as crop wide relatives. And also Mexico is uh, a modern mountainous region within a tropical latitude, which means that several populations of species persisted through the glacial cycles. So that genetic diversity accumulated and is expected to be high among populations. Choosing our species, uh, our 100 species has been a challenge, um, but we are in summary, including the suggestions that we have with Team Conavio along with expert suggestion. We aim to represent all major ecosystems of the, of the country, as well as crop wide relatives in some of the species that are domesticated. From this, we are creating a subset of species that already have available data, and this includes genetic, but especially some sort of abundance data. And we have also a list of priority species for the country. This includes representatives of the major taxonomic groups. They have contrasting dispersal abilities and includes different forms of reality, of rarity. We have several different types of data sources. I have mentioned before, this can include genetic data, but we are focusing on a species um, that not necessarily have genetic data, but they have uh, estimation of, sample of abundance from citizen science or presence of populations from occurrence data. And I'm gonna focus in an example of this type next. So the species I'm gonna present as an example is Juniperus monticola. This is a representative of our pine glassland. It occurs in um, very high elevation mountains. We have occurrence data from scientific collections, some found in purple in the map, and from citizen science, some in shown in orange. We don't have any real census size, but we have an approximate size that can be undertaken from experts' opinion. So first, um, for the indicator to the proportion of populations maintained, we first uh, made clusters among the high elevation mountains where the species has been seen. If it has been seen historically and recently in the last 15 years, we recorded this population as still existing. If the population has been record, hasn't been recorded in decades and the habitat has been mostly destroyed, we can assume that this population is most likely locally extinct. And if the species hasn't been seen recently, but the habitat still exists, we just don't know if the population is still there. So based on this, we estimate that for this species, we have two extinct populations and 15 populations still exist. Then, as I told you before, we don't have real abundance data, but we can ask local botanists and scientists working in these regions for an estimate of the size of the populations within each cluster of mountains. For example, they can tell us if the population is definitely uh, smaller than 5,000 individuals, or larger than 5,000, but not by much, maybe just few tens or hundreds more. Then for indicator three, we don't have a genetic monitoring, but we know that there are some genetic studies um, phylogeographic. So overall, if you cluster these together, we have that for indicator one, we have uh, four out of 11 populations that have more than 5,000 individuals, which means a 0.36 for indicator one. 
for uh, indicator two, we have 15 of out of 17 populations still existing and indicator three equals zero. What I want to highlight here is that we don't only didn't have genetic data, we actually didn't have um, abundance data properly, but still we could assess this species based on the knowledge of local botanists and naturalists that uh, visit the mountain ranges where these species exist. So to summarize the approach we are taking in Conavio, Mexico, is that we are creating a subset of species that are representative of each of the major ecosystems of Mexico, taxonomic groups, contrasting dispersal ability, different forms of reality. And this includes uh, species that are have been already studied, priority species, and species that are uh, related to crops. We are creating this list with the feedback of experts, and we are assessing the species with uh, very different types of data sources, including proper genetic data, but especially local knowledge on the abundance of the data and also other assessments that have been already done before. And with this, we hope that Mexico could uh, contribute to the indicators that are being proposed in the post 2020 framework. Now uh, I'm gonna briefly uh, switch hats here and I'm gonna tell you about something that we have created in this group to, uh, to standardize the way we collect data. So uh, in the last year, we realized that it is very important to have tools that allow to facilitate and to standardize the way we collect data across different groups in different countries for different types of data. So we made these resources available. This can be uh, seen already in the link before below, which uh, my colleagues will share in the chat. We created a COBOL web form. This is an online questionnaire that has controlled vocabularies, multiple options that you can click, and little hints that allow you to collect data for each indicator for each species. We also created a set of guidance documents that give detailed advice on how to fill the form, but also how to um, undertake the genetic monitoring at the country level, for instance, how to, speak, to choose your species list. And we also created a Google users group for frequently asked questions regarding the uh, two previous points. Mm. Um, the screenshots I showed you before in the Uniper's Monticola section actually come from the form. This is how it looks, and I'm going to quickly show it to you live in a moment. Uh, and then what this form is allowing us to do is that regardless if the species was collected in South Africa and has genetic studies providing the effective size, we can have the same data structure than for a species collected in Mexico, where we didn't have uh, genetic data, but that where we have um, um, expert opinion on the approximate uh, census size for each population. I'm gonna uh, quickly show you how this looks. First of all, in the link I gave you, uh, this is a, a little web GitHub website we have, and you can find all the links to what I'm showing you here. And this is how the form looks. This is a view only version of the form, which we made available for you to just have a look at how it looks. As you can see, there are some mandatory uh, fields. Uh, we prevented typing errors as much as possible. For instance, if I'm trying to write Mexico here, then it will appear in the list so I can select it, and this will prevent all the different ways of writing Mexico with or without the accent, for instance. Then I have all the data for the species taxonomy. Um, and then I can type here the number of known extinct and extant populations. For instance, in the Juniper Monticola example, I type two here. If there are extinct population, it asks me for the name of them. So I can name them here. And if I type the uh, number of known populations, I'm going to try three here. And then I can select uh, some of the of these answers. And as you can see, it will pop out new questions depending on what you are answering. 
I just want to show you quickly uh, that it will ask you if there is uh, any data on population sizes. I can say yes, and I can specify if this is uh, coming from genetic studies to estimate the affected population size. And I can say no or yes. And if there is census size, which is which I answer for the uh, Juniperos example. And once I do that, then here I have um, um, I, I have the uh, population questions where I can specify if this is a population that was naturally occurring or if it was introduced and so on. And one type, one type, what type of genetic, sorry, of census data I have. So we hope that with this uh, form, we are going to have a easier way to collect data across countries and to simplify the process of data analysis later on. That's everything on my side. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks to all of our speakers. These are excellent examples of how the indicators can be used across not just different countries, but different types of species and different taxa. Um, so there's been generating a lot of discussion in the chat. We have quite a few questions that have been popping up. Um, so we can just have a question period now, maybe for about 12 or so minutes. Um, again, if you have a question you want to ask in a person, just raise your hand. We can open your mic, or if you have a question, just um, put it in the chat. Uh, Kathy, uh, yes. if you don't mind, actually, uh, Maggie was helping us in uh, compiling all the different questions. So I would go uh, as we receive this question, if you, if you don't mind, okay? Yep, sure. Okay, so uh, we start with uh, James Williams, who was asking about um, uh, in the UK, we are using any below or equal to 50 from a UK inventory as animal genetic resources indicator. And so uh, we are going to discuss a little bit, we'd like to, to know a little bit more in detail whether or not these uh, different values uh, of any, how they can uh, homogenize one to, to each other. So I will leave the floor to Sean, Linda, or other people to reply to this specific question from uh, James. Thank you for the question, James. Um, as you know, NE has been used in the agricultural field for decades. and I think the recommended minimum size depends on the breed and the organism, chickens versus goats, cows, etc. Some of them are as low as 50, and this is because domesticated breeds don't have to deal with adaptation to the environment, extreme events, uh, predation, etc. So wild populations need to have a larger NE than domesticated breeds. So that's the simple answer why um, NE500, and there's a lot of scientific support for the NE500 for wild populations. Okay, uh, then we can move from uh, to, to a very uh, interesting question uh, that were raised by some of you. Basically, Andy uh, was asking about uh, this example seems to provide an indication of how genetic diversity is being maintained at a country level. Are there plans to do the same times of estimate across a species that occurs in multiple countries? Yes. So, I mean, we present them countrywise because nations typically report back to the CBD per country, per nation. But for some species, it will be of value to assess them over transnational at the transnational level. So we will elaborate on, on those possibilities as well. But we like to have a system that can be reported per nation. Okay, good. Then I think there's another uh, quite relevant question shared by many different participants, which is about uh, how you select the species for uh, indicators to be reported. There's a, um, there's a risk, but you're going to select the, the most easy species to be monitored in terms of the genetic diversity, and this uh, would introduce a bias. So basically, they would like to know from which species we should or we can start to report on genetic diversity. Not to put you on the spot, but Jess or Alicia, if you want to discuss how you did this for your country. I can go first. 
Um, so it's true, uh, some of the species that were reported, they're nice distinct units, but a lot of the work that's being done is involves consultation with many people and experts um, with, on, within particular species. Um, and so what might look quite simple has actually been like hours of discussion and trying to delimit um, species. But also uh, we chose species of, that were of particular national importance and, the, and that would cover across a variety of rare status, conservation status, and all of that. And again, as we projected for South Africa in the coming years, we will strive to do complete taxonomic lists um, just to get an idea of what can be done um, and if this will differ. And undoubtedly for certain species, um, establishing the any get into there one might be very difficult, but it would be good to then know that information to see maybe where the gaps are and how this can be improved for the future. I just briefly would like to add that uh, we haven't reached a final consensus on the list for the reasons, but we aim to have a representative, representative this, the whole country so that what we say about the species that we select can actually tell us how are other species from the same habitat uh, doing. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so we, we are giving advice on representing different habitats, rarity types, uh, longevity, so species lifespan, important for genetic diversity, and a few other axes to get a representative group. So thank you. Are there more questions, Christiana? Not really, uh, but uh, if someone feels what uh, is or a question was dismissed, please uh, go ahead by raising your hand. There's yeah, something ar ar about population delimitation, which I think is one of the most relevant and critical issue. But, uh, sometimes, especially if you estimate, uh, someone pointed out the, the size of the population on a country level, then you might turn up in having a very small population, which is probably not the case for transboundary species. So how we, we can deal uh, with this specific issue? As someone did ask in the, in the um, maybe just to expand on the question James asked about delimiting populations. If you consider a population too narrow, you are, you know, assuming something is too small. So the delimitation of populations is done using a pragmatic approach of looking at species maps, consulting experts, and just deciding whether populations truly are isolated from other populations. That's the main criteria. Um, so that they are distinct units and evolving on their own. Yeah, uh, from Graham, a very interesting uh, question about where a species is selected uh, that occurs both in the wild and under domestication. Uh, it, it would be interesting, des desirable to record this indicator for both the wild relatives and the domesticated format types. Are these being considered? Um, I would like to answer that. Uh... Short answer, yes. Uh, long answer, we didn't include it in these examples because it's a little bit more complex than in the entirely wild species. But yes, we are considering that. We in Mexico had several examples of, for instance, plants that are fully domesticated, wild relatives, and also somewhere in the in-between, which are managed species in the wild. Um, and they are the same species if you go for a scientific name. So we are considering this and we hope to have feedback and maybe get in touch with you to let you know what we are doing. Yvonne, your hand, do you want to also answer? Yes, yeah, so this is also happens for fish or with some fish species that are also uh, supplemented uh, in rivers. That's why uh, maybe uh, for the next year we will want to try an automated uh, uh, an automated procedure that will use uh, demographic monitoring data that focus on all the species in the country, at least for freshwater fish, so that uh, uh, will uh, correct for uh, species selection biases. 
And we will also check uh, with data from uh, harvesting and supplementing uh, if we can also uh, address this problem. And maybe other countries that have uh, this kind of demographic monitoring data, like Sweden or uh, or Belgium also, uh, we can also apply this procedure to, to these countries. Thanks very much, Yvonne. If there are other questions, please raise your hand or ask in the chat. James, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Sean and colleagues for the presentations. Interesting stuff. Um, I think there's a big question for me, both around the choice of the species, because if you're choosing a sample, how do you make that representative? How do you make sure that that's focused on those things that you feel are important in a country? Because that could make a very, very big difference to whether the result is high or low. And also, I think there is a question there about scale. So just to take a practical example, uh, when uh, conventional migratory species scientific council considered a listing of Jaguar um, at previous COP, um, at a global scale, it's considered least concerned because of quite large quantities within the Amazon basin. But if you look at the um, populations on the borders of the countries uh, involved, and it was a coalition of eight um, South American countries who were putting forward the proposal, many of those populations were endangered or critically endangered. So I think there is a really big question here about the scale of the assessment that you undertake, whether that's at a population level, whether that's at a national level, or whether that's at a global level, and I think you will probably find that you get different answers. So I think it's actually quite important when we are considering these processes that we think about the scale that we need for the process that we need. If you're managing an individual population, you probably need the information for the individual population. If you're thinking about the species as a whole, you probably need to think about the global population. Thanks so much, James. And we um, will have a bit limited time, but we would welcome interaction with you and, and discussing with you further to, and with anyone on the call to further improve the guidance on, on these indicators. Um, briefly, uh, selection of species. Um, there is a bias in most biodiversity indicators, including the Red List and Living Planet Index on what data is available and, and what, Species got evaluated first on the red list due to country concerns, et cetera. Um, but we can do our best to try to remove the bias. Um, and then, yes, we look forward to talking to you more about the scale of populations and potential evaluations beyond the country level. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Kanishon. There's two more questions in the chat. Considering the index will be um, between countries, the number of species by IUCN category can influence the index value. Do you recommend some proportion in each IUCN category, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, et cetera? Um, at present, we have not made a recommendation of precise proportions per category. I think it would make sense and consistent with our other advice so far to do proportional to how many in each of those categories in that country. Um, yeah, just similar to representing proportional by habitat and, and things like that. And the last question is about uh, countries for which there is no budget uh, for biodiversity monitoring. This is definitely a challenge with um, much of the reporting for CBD. And so I think our examples of countries that are involving local knowledge holders in discussions and um, trying to leverage that local knowledge um, about approximate population sizes even um, and whether populations have been lost uh, can be done without formal monitoring programs. And again, um, for those who are 
No, if you're comfortable asking your question in Spanish, Portuguese, or French, please do in the chat. Uh, but for now, I think we will close our Q&A. We will continue to record questions. If you just put them in the chat, we will record all of them and answer all of them later and provide you links to that. But for now, uh, Alicia, if you would like to introduce um, your guests, and then we will have, so we will have one more um, short presentation from a colleague, and then we will move towards closing the webinar. So Alicia, go ahead. Thank you, Shen. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Andrea Cruz from Conabio. She coordinates the biodiversity national strategies as well as the international um, department in Conabio. Andrea? Uh, you are, your microphone is mute. Sorry, it happens all the time. Hello, good morning, good afternoon or evening to everyone, uh, depending on where, which part of the world you are. Thank you, Alicia and organizers for your kind invitation to the webinar and discussion on genetic diversity in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. My name, as Alicia says, I said it was, is Andrea Cruz. I work at Conavio, Mexico since 2006. I am currently the head of cooperation on biodiversity uh, direction, where I coordinate the update and follow up of the national biodiversity strategy and the state biodiversity strategies. And I have coordinated also the elaboration of the fifth and sixth national reports to the CBD. So I have been involved from in CBD negotiations since, since 2009. In Conavia, we believe that the conservation of genetic diversity within and among populations is crucial for the biodiversity resilience because it allows the species to adapt to new environmental and biotic conditions. In this sense, our country is committed to do so. Our conservation efforts on genetic diversity have had a special emphasis on crop wild relatives because Mexico is one of the regions of the world where several crops were domesticated. However, conserving genetic diversity of all species and not only those related to crops is equally important for our country. Since we are a mega diverse uh, country with thousands of endemic species and important populations widespread, uh, of widespread species. Um, with regards to the GPF uh, post 2020 and the monitoring framework to be adopted in this up, uh, upcoming December, Mexico supports a clear goal and, a corris and corresponding targets for the genetic diversity of all species. So the indicators discussed today will allow tracking of species and populations within uh, them to maintain their genetic diversity. We consider it very important that these indicators can be estimated without genetic data. For this, Conavio is currently helping to demonstrate the practical use of the indicators with already available data at our national databases, as well as the collaboration with groups of experts and data from citizen science. So we are confident that it is possible to report these indicators in an affordable and timely way. We are interested in using these indicators to report to the CBD and or, or other um, MIAs because we believe that enhancing transparency and accountability will ensure the success of this GBF to be adopted. But we have to be very careful also not to generate an extra burden for national focal points in charge of reporting to the CBD. So in this sense, the genetic diversity indicators resulting from this expert col collaboration will be crucial. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so before we close the meeting, we have a quick poll that we're just asking you, um, maybe after now that you've heard how these indicators work and can have seen examples of how they can be used. 
um, if you can just go to menti.com, so the link that, or the link we just put in the chat, um, and let us know, uh, do you feel with guidance and support that you can report on genetic diversity indicators? So again, if you go to menti.com, enter the code 12387175, and we're starting to see some answers come up pretty positive. <laughs> That's great. Um, so now I'll leave the poll open, but uh, maybe I'll just hand it over to Linda for some closing messages. Linda, go ahead. Make sure you are unmuted, Linda. Yeah, we can't hear you or see you. Sorry. So we hope to see you in Montreal because we will go, be going to COP15. So we hope we have had many questions here and we hope to be able to continue the discussions there. And we will have a side event that we hope that you will be able to join in person or virtually on Saturday, December 10 at lunchtime. So we will provide lunch and also new presentation and updates on the work that we have talked a little bit about here. We will also have an exhibition booth that we will where we you will be able to find us throughout the whole meeting. So please come and see us there and talk more and we can discuss more opportunities for the genetic indicators. We are also have several resources online that you can have a look at. This webinar will be available on on YouTube, you will be sent information about that, but you can also have a look at these websites, GBike website and the Coalition for Conservation Genetics, where we have policy briefs in many languages, all our publications on these topics, statements and suggestions to the CBD and fact sheets and much more. We are also on Twitter where you can follow us if you want to. Um, I'd like to highlight a couple of new, new preprints that are not yet published but are available online as a preprint. Uh, more information on what we have discussed here, how we are doing the assessment in nine countries right now. And we are also interested if more countries want to join us and try these indicators in your nations, please contact us and become part of our team. You can also see the COBO form that we have talked about here. It's accessible, so you can have a look at it and see how it can be used in your country. And we also have a preprint of discussing goals and targets, how they can be improved in this final step of COP15. So please join us and work for a strong goal and target and indicators for genetic diversity. And do let's help out so we can assure that we maintain sufficient genetic diversity to allow for adaptation in the future. Thank you very much for joining our webinar. Thanks.